sound recording. Okay, so uh, Sam was mentioning my Osiris talk that I did for Romancing the Gothic last year and anyone who saw that will know that there were a lot of my holiday photos in it. So I'm starting off today with another one of my holiday photos. Uh, it doesn't look like all that much, you know, it's flowers and trees, but if you look this bit of blue here, this is Lake Geneva. And here, this building that you can just see through the trees is the Villa Diodati. And the reason that you've got to peer through the trees is, it, is because it's a private residence, basically, um, and they don't really want people there peering at it. But I went there as a sort of celebrity stalking 200 years out of date, because this is the place where 200 summers before I was there in uh, 2016, this is where uh, Lord Byron was staying with his doctor, John Polidori. And one night they had uh, Percy Shelley and Mary Godwin as she was then, and uh, Claire Claremont round and Byron proposes they all write a ghost story. And out of that night in this house comes Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And it's a book that I first discovered uh, when I was about 15 after seeing the Kenneth Branagh film of it. Um, so that was that was what led me to read the book. And I'm not going to go into the details of the story because I'm presuming that if you're here, you've got some familiarity, if not with the book, then at least with one of the many, many, many interpretations there have been. It's a book that's had an awful lot of layers put over the top of it. Um, last summer, because of the National Theatre at home, I got to see the Danny Boyle version. Uh, which I've been wanting to see for a very long time with Benedict Cumberbatch and uh, Johnny Lee Miller. Um, and it starts at the moment when the creature comes to life. You, you see the creature um, coming around and it works really well. Like the fact that it starts there is amazing for the dramatic tension of the play, but I was a little bit disappointed that it missed out all the bits about the creation of the creature. And I realize that that's because it's my favorite bit. And this is because this is where Mary Shelley's novel collides with my world. Um, and so what I want to do today, because this is not intended as a literary analysis of Frankenstein, because there are people who could do that far better than me. This is to look at where Frankenstein does collide with my world, you know, how it interacts with the world of medicine at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and so, you know, this is from the viewpoint of somebody whose daily business is medical history and body parts. So I just want to give a couple of words about what it is that I do as a human remains conservator. I mean, the, the job title really says it all. I take parts of human body that have been around for a long time, make sure that they can't decompose further, there can't be any further deterioration. And this involves things like changing fluids and removing fat. Uh, my job involves an awful lot of removing fat. Um, you know, it involves making cases and mounts, sewing things up, rehydrating things that have dried up. I love my job. And a lot of the stuff that I work with dates to the 18th and the 19th century. So a lot of it is around the time that uh, Frankenstein was written. Um, and I just wanna show you a couple of pictures of where I work. So this is the lab that I spend my days in. It's, uh, well, not at the moment. It's a sort of vaulted lab in a basement. You know, there are stairs down to it. Um, I've taken these pictures very, very carefully. So there are no actual human remains in them but it still gives you this idea of what you might think of as a modern day Frankenstein's lab. Though the impression that we get of the lab all comes from films because Mary Shelley never really, really describes what it's like in Victor Frankenstein's lab. And that's gonna be a little bit of a theme of the things that I'm talking about tonight, that Mary Shelley is very cl cleverly hinting at things, but she never goes into the detail of the creation of this creature. But I'd like to start with uh, talking a little bit about the birth of Mary Shelley herself, because it tells us a lot about what medicine was like at this point. 
So Mary Shelley's parents were these people, William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. They were both radicals. Uh, William Godwin was a writer and a philosopher. Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, she went over to the French Revolution. She's a feminist. She writes the vindication of the rights of women. She's also the subject of a very, very bizarre recent statue. And she's already had a child by the time she has Mary, Mary Shelley. Um, she's got a daughter, Fanny, uh, from a previous relationship, which she wasn't, where she wasn't married to the uh, father, which was quite scandalous at this point in time. But her first birth was easy. When she gives birth to Mary, it's not easy. And part of uh, Mary's sort of feminist outlook in life meant that she wanted a midwife there as she gave birth. And this was quite unusual in uh, the upper classes, which Mary Wollstonecraft was among, really, because largely, like through the 18th century, um, men had started to get involved in the process of birth. You know, all through time, it's always been women attending births. Usually if a doctor or a surgeon was got involved, that meant that something had gone wrong. Generally, either the mother or the child or both would die. Usually it was midwives who dealt with, with childbirth. But in the 18th century, obstetricians come along, men get involved. But Mary Wollstonecraft doesn't want that. She wants a midwife. So she has Mrs. Blenkinsop attend her. But there is a problem. Mrs. Blenkinsop says that the afterbirth will not come away. And that means that a doctor is called. And uh, Dr. Ponyard comes along and he has to reach inside Mary Wollstonecraft's uterus and pull the uh, placenta away with his hands. Now, this is a point when, um, you know, this is uh, 40 years before a man called Ignaz Sammelweis will come along. And Ignaz Sammelweis uh, is investigating maternal death in Vienna. He's a Hungarian doctor, but he works in a hospital in Vienna. And he's noticed that of the two maternity wards they have, one of them has a mortality rate of 10%. The other one only, and I'm using the word very loosely here, only has the mortality rate of 4%. And this seems really, really high. Um, you've got to remember at this point when Mary, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft has given birth, uh, it's, the chances are that one in 133 women are going to die in the UK from um, given, giving birth. So sh shocking numbers. So Samuel starts to investigate why these two maternity wards have different mortality rates. And he looks at everything. He looks at the techniques used, he even looks at the religious practices in case that's affecting it. And he finds no differences apart from one of them, the one with the higher mortality rate is used for training doctors. The one with the lower mortality rate is used for training midwives. And then in 1847, a friend of his dies after having his finger nicked uh, during a dissection. And his autopsy shows very similar findings to the women who have died of pupil fever, childbirth fever. And so Samuel comes to the conclusion it must be the same thing causing it. And the conclusion that he comes to is that this is something that's coming from the dead bodies. Now, there wasn't a real understanding of germ theory at this point, so his idea was it's something about the smell. The idea at this point is that miasma or bad air causes illness. And so he gets the people who are leaving the, uh, uh, the dissection rooms and the autopsy rooms to clean their hands with uh, chlorinated lime before going on their ward rounds. Um, and the idea isn't that this can kill germs as we would think of it today, but the idea was that uh, chlorinated lime got rid of bad smells. So it would get rid of the bad air that they thought might be causing the disease. And this does indeed bring the mortality rates down enormously. Um, and this is a good thing, yeah? He writes it up, it's published through the medical world. It does not go down very well with medics. Um, one, uh, one doctor said, uh, the doctor is a gentleman and a gentleman's hands are clean. So the idea that you would need to wash your hands 
you know, it, it was just completely alien to them. Of course, my hands are clean. And so you can imagine if this is in uh, 1854 that this is being said, that in 1797, when Mary Shelley is being born, that doctor who's came in and removed the placenta from Mary Wollstonecraft's wound, womb, he certainly hasn't washed his hands. And this does indeed lead to pupil fever. Uh, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft dies 12 days later um, from a septicemia caused by bacteria that's got through the wound where her placenta once was. It's a long, painful death. And Mary Shelley will grow up learning to read and write her name by tracing the letters on Mary Wollstonecraft's tomb in Old St Pancras' churchyard. So this is the young lady who will go on to publish Frankenstein when she's only 21. And as I said, in the book that um, she gives very few details about the actual making of the creature, but we see that Victor's journey starts with looking at alchemists. Um, and this is just a quote showing that um, they think that in 1818, it's got an air of reality attached to it. They're not seeing this as a fantastical book. But in chapter two, um, Victor Frankenstein talks about finding a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa, and, uh, who's an alchemist. And then he moves on to other alchemists, Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. And I just want to give a little bit of an idea about who these alchemists are by looking at this chap. Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. And he's known better to history as Paracelsus, uh, for which we're all very, very grateful. This is a portrait that's in uh, an obscure stairway in the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, where I work. So why would a surgical institution put a portrait of an alchemist on the wall? Now, the idea of alchemy came out of ancient Egypt, and it's you know, it developed in many, many, many parts of the world, but it came into Europe and alchemists that Mary Shelley is interested in via the Moorish invasion of Spain in, uh, in the 800s. And this brings the idea that metals are made up of a mix of mercury and sulfur in varying quantities. And when you get the right mix of mercury and sulfur, that's when you get, you know, the high metals, you get gold, you get silver, whereas less good um, uh, proportions of mercury and sulfur get you things like tin and copper and lead and the like. So alchemists had the idea if you could just tweak these proportions of mercury and sulfur just, just a little bit, then you might be able to make your metal into gold. And it was thought that the mechanism of this would be something called the philosopher's stone. And it was often believed that this, in the form of an elixir of life, could give immortality. And the idea was that the same alchemical processes that you could use to transfer for metals, they're going on in your body as well. Um, because obviously, how else would you be able to uh, turn food, as you eat it, into you? You know, some transformation is going on there. And that's quite a sort of simplified idea but you can see how this will develop into um, things like chemistry and modern medicine, especially into pharmacology, because they thought that illness was um, these are chemical reactions going wrong and then you could address these. So it's, it's kind of getting to the idea of treating something that's going wrong within you, as opposed to the ancient Greek um, theory of the four humours and you having to re, uh, rebalance your humours. Now Paracelsus, he trained in medicine, but he rejected a lot of the conventional teachings of his day. He said, I have not been ashamed to learn from tramps, butchers and barbers. He also said that the dose makes the poison. So he used things like mercury and arsenic, which we know are poisonous, and he knew were poisonous, as cures. And it's kind of like the idea of chemotherapy today, that, uh, you know, you're using things that are uh, toxic to kill the cancer and you just hope that it does that before it kills you. And his use of mercury to treat syphilis carried on right into the beginning of the 20th century. There was even one company in London that produced uh, 
chocolates which had mercury in, um, in in about 1900 and that meant that you know if you were a man who'd been doing something that you shouldn't be doing with a woman you shouldn't be doing it with and came home and gave your wife syphilis you didn't even need to tell her you could buy her some chocolates and it looks like you're actually being quite nice but one of the things that uh, Paracelsus was doing was he was telling the physicians of his day that they shouldn't be so focused on book learning, that they should be trying things for themselves and they should be experimenting and they should be seeing what actually works. So alchemy progresses into science, but it's usually, you know, by the time you get into the 19th and 20th century, it's dismissed as superstition because they thought that magic was involved there as well. You know, you don't want to have, once you get into the enlightenment, you don't want to be thinking about that kind of thing. Even though Arthur C. Clarke says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it's interesting to think about alchemists in relation to the novel uh, because of one of the things that Mary Maeve encountered in her travels. And this is another one of my holiday photos. Uh, this is Berg Frankenstein, uh, which is uh, near the Rhine in Germany. Uh, and this is Polly in Castle Frankenstein. And we know that Mary uh, passed less than 10 miles away from here when she was traveling back from Switzerland in 1815, the year before that fateful night in Geneva. It was a tourist destination even back then, so there's a chance that they may have visited it. And one of the things about Berg Frankenstein is that it's got its own story of an alchemist. Uh, this man, Johann Konrad Dippel, he was said by some locals to have sold his soul to the devil. Uh, he claimed to have found the elixir of life. Uh, he became interested in this around 1700 um, and he produced what came to be called dipples oil which was produced from the distillation of various animal products like bone and horn and leather and it formed this black oil that he said could cure all disease. Um, pretty certain that wasn't actually the case, though it didn't turn out to be uh, useful in World War II, where it was used on various desert campaigns to coat the inside of wells to make uh, the water undrinkable. But Dipple experimented with cadavers, and he claimed that he could transfer souls from one cadaver to another by use of a funnel, of course. Now, as I said, there's no mention in Mary Shelley's diary about her stopping here or hearing these stories, but it seems a little bit too much of a coincidence, certainly in the name, that it hasn't at least subconsciously registered as they were traveling. Particularly if we look at this quote from later in Frankenstein, where they talk about Mannheim and Mainz, and they describe the area where Castle Frankenstein actually is. And there are quite a number of castles uh, on that stretch of the Rhine, but the fact that she's specifically uh, taking out this part to describe just seems a little bit too much of a coincidence for me. Uh, as a tangent, one of the other things that Johann Konrad Dippel does when he's living in Berlin in 1706 was he lends some of the potash that he uses for making his Dippel oil uh, to the man that he shares a lab with, who's a printmaker called Johann Jakob Diesbach. And Diesbach is trying to make a red cochineal dye and he uses some of this potash and he discovers this thing, Prussian blue, uh, the first synthetic blue dye. Uh, it was initially known, known as Berlin blue since that's where it was made, but it's later used to um, dye the uniforms of the Prussian army. And so that's why it becomes known as Prussian blue. Uh, it's also used in the 18th century in the ma manufacture of hydrogen cyanide which is known as prussic acid because of the connection with Prussian blue. Um, and this is what John Polidori, Byron's doctor, uh, is believed to have used to kill himself in 1821 at the age of 25, uh, though the doctor did record natural causes. And in my world, Prussian blue is very important for staining wax to do blue veins when you're making things like this, when you're doing arterial injections. So, you know, Prussian blue is uh, very, very useful in anatomy. And this is where um, 
Victor's journey begins with the alchemist and trying to extend life. He talks about under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence in the search of the philosopher's stone. So he's looking here at trying to extend life, but as you move through, he starts to think of it differently. He starts to think about the idea of creating life. Whence, I often ask myself, did the principle of life proceed? And then he talks about, I might process in time to renew life. Uh, where death had occurred. And then as the journey continues and he's starting to think about actually making life, we get my favorite quote from Frankenstein, to examine the cause of life, we must first have recourse to death. And that's what the anatomists of this time are doing as well. But if you're gonna create life, how do you go about it? So this is Robert De Niro and Kenneth Branagh's Frank Frankenstein from 1994. You can see that he's got a lot of stitches. Um, and the thing about these stitches is they're not very good. You know, they're barely holding the skin together. You can see the skin gaping. They're not gonna be creating a barrier against the outside world, which is what the skin is meant to do. And without that, you know, you're gonna get infection and any creature you make this way would end up dying fairly quickly. And this is something that we've got to think about when we're thinking about making a creature. And as I said, Mary is not giving us a whole lot of details, but she's dropping a lot of hints. Um, and she tells us that Victor collects bones from charnel houses and disturbs with profane fingers the uh, tremulous secrets of the human frame. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials. So if you've got all these bits, really the only way you can put them together is stitching them like we see in so many of the Frankenstein films. She also tells us that it's a bit fiddly doing this. So she makes, makes her, he makes his creature large, eight feet in height. Um, and we're told that some of the materials are coming from the slaughterhouses and you can't really make an eight foot creature just from human parts like that. Uh, so is Victor getting animal parts and grafting them onto human parts to make something so large? Again, it's not explicit. But we have to remember that if you are trying to sew lots of bits of body together like this, it's not as simple as just doing a rough line of stitches around the outside. Everything needs to be joined. Tendons, muscles, um, nerves, blood vessels, ligaments, all of them have got to be very, very securely attached to one another or it's not just going to work. And that's particularly important with blood vessels because otherwise they leak. And this is something that couldn't be done at the time when Mary Shelley was writing. Joining up of blood vessels, and the, the technical word for it is called vascular anastomosis, only really became popular uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was down to a, um, a surgeon called Alexis Carell. And his mother was actually an embroiderer. And he certainly consulted some of the best embroiderers in France, which is where he was from, in order to gain techniques. And what he came up with was this, it's called triangulation, where you get three stitches to pull the vein into as wide a triangle you can, as you can, making those surfaces nice and tight to make them easy to very delicately sew up. And this kind of vascular anastomosis is incredibly useful. Not only is it good for dealing with trauma, but without this, you wouldn't be able to get organ transplantation. Uh, so Carell's work directly led on to the ability to transplant organs from uh, one person to another. And Carell quite rightly got the Nobel Prize uh, in 1904. I might've got the year wrong there, but in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. So Carell might seem like a wonderful man and we should all thank him. He was also a hideous uh, eugenicist who between World War I and World War II wrote a book uh, proposing a humane and economical solution for the weaker members of society who he thought should be disposed of in small euthanasic institutes supplied with appropriate gases, which does uh, have a horrible echo of about what, towards what's going to happen in World War II. Um, 
so good and awful. Um, so this is get this is thinking about how you would stitch things up. But it's worth mentioning that if we look at this, which is the frontispiece to the 1831 edition of Frankenstein, you can see the creature at the front. There's no evidence of stitching here. And this is an illustration that would have been approved by Mary Shelley. Uh, and this is a bit later, this is 1883 from a play adaptation of the book. And again, the creature has no signs of being all stitched together. So this idea possibly has just crept into our psyches because of its ubiquitousness in the myriad of Frankenstein films. So Frankenstein has mentioned the dissecting room and the slaughterhouse, um, but he also mentions being forced to spend his days and nights in vaults and charnel houses. Um, I dabbled in, amongst, in the un, among the unhallowed damps of the grave. Um, so he's going, he's digging up bodies. We're talking here about grave robbing. Um, In Ingolstadt, where Victor is studying, uh, they wouldn't have had the same problems with body shortages that we had in Britain at this point. It, in, in a lot of the German states at this point, you could actually use bodies for medical study from poor houses and jails, as would happen in Britain after the 1832 Anatomy Act. But at the end of the 19th and the uh, end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, uh, grave robbing was you know, in full swing here in Britain. And Mary's understanding of this would come from a myriad of newspaper reports about these things. It was a genuine fear, people going to great lengths to stop it. And also from John Polidori. So John Polidori, Byron's doctor who was with them that night, he'd studied medicine in Edinburgh between 1810 and 1815. So he's only just finished his degree the year before uh, that night on Lake Geneva. And uh, Polidori would have been taught by this man, Alexandra Munro Tertius. Um, he's called Tertius because he's part of an anatomical din dynasty. There was a Munro Primus and Munro Secundus. Um, and to get, between the three of them, they held the chair of anatomy at Edinburgh University for 126 years. Primus and Secundus, however, were very, very good lecturers. Um, Tertius, less so. Uh, Charles Darwin, who studied under him in the 1820s, said that his lectures were as dull as the man himself. Uh, and he you know, is described as being dirty in his person. Uh, people, uh, students record, uh, record that he, uh, he went to his lectures covered in blood from surgery. So you can imagine, you know, how these kind of uh, diseases that, uh, you know, killed Mary Wollstonecraft are spreading from people like this. Um, and a year out of medical school, uh, Polidori is likely to have been talking about the things that he's seen, and he certainly would have been dissecting cadavers that had came from body snatching. And body snatching had become a necessity for studying anatomy uh, because the legal me uh, methods of getting cadavers just didn't meet demand. In 1751, you get something which is called the Murder Act. And this is an act that's passed uh, th so that anyone who's hanged for the crime of murder either has to go to be gibbeted, so that means that they're, uh, they're hung up in a cage until their body is decomposed, or they're sent to the anatomists. And we've got Hogarth's fourth stage of cruelty from 1751. And this was a series of uh, four illustrations which show uh, Tom Nero going from a young boy who tortures animals to murdering his pregnant lover. And in the final, final uh, illustration, we see him on the anatomist table opened up with a dog feasting on his intestines. The thing is, though, that at Edinburgh University, in Edinburgh at that time, you've got Edinburgh University, which is one of considered one of the best medical schools in Europe. Uh, it has hundreds of pupils every year. You've got 
Surgeons Hall, where I work, which is also doing dissection to train surgeons. You've also got a number of um, private anatomy schools around Edinburgh uh, so that students can go and get extramural teaching, particularly during the time of Munro Tertius, whose lectures were so abominable. So there are a lot of people trying to get cadavers to dissect. Um, and there are just not enough people being hanged for murder. And so this means that the body snatchers are doing a flourishing business. Uh, the claim for Edinburgh's earliest body snatching story goes back to February 1678, an Egypty boy uh, found missing from his grave the day after his hanging. But through the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, there are gangs um, springing up who can take multiple corpses in a night to sell to the anatomists. Um, and it also gets to the point of being uh, sometimes murder. It, for example, in the case of Burke and Hare, uh, um, and we have a pocketbook bound in the skin of William Burke, or at least said to be bound in the skin of William Burke in Surgeon's Hall Museum. And these are the cadavers that are providing the medical education that Polidori has just finished. And in a letter, Percy uh, Shelley mentions Polidori telling him an anecdote that makes his blood run cold. He doesn't record what it is. So is this a story from his time in Edinburgh? But Polidori was a physician, and as such, he's the top rung of the medical hierarchy ladder with surgeons underneath and then uh, apothecaries at the bottom, kind of like pharmacist. Physicians were university educated men. And it'll seem quite strange to us now that to be a surgeon, uh, you, didn't, you usually weren't university educated. Uh, you certainly didn't need to have a medical degree, though this is starting to creep in at this point. Um, Surgery is effectively, it's a trade, a craft. It's learnt by apprenticeship rather than university education. Um, and one person who was going down this road is John Keats. Uh, he thought that medicine and poetry were interlinked disciplines with medicine to treat the pain of the body and poetry to treat, uh, treat the pain of the soul. And Keats is often mentioned in the same breath as Byron and Percy Shelley but their backgrounds are really different. You know, Byron and Shelley, they're aristocrats. Keats is very firmly in the middle classes. And he's entering a profession that's much lower down the social scale than a doctor. And you've got to remember that Byron and Shelley, they look down on Polidori because he was a doctor rather than an aristocrat. Um, Keats had initially trained as an apothecary but his apprenticeship came to the end in 1815, the same time when the Apothecary Act meant that in order to actually be able to be licensed, you had to have spent some time working in a hospital. Um, and so he signs up to work, but work in a hospital, but decides to sign up for a bit longer. So at the end of it, he can register with the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And he becomes a student at Guy's Hospital where he received lectures from Henry Klein. And we're going to talk about Henry Klein a, a bit later. He was appointed a surgical dresser, which is a position of responsibility that not many students got the opportunity of. Um, and it's effectively assistant to the surgeon. The surgeon that he's assigned to is William Lucas, who had a bad reputation. His, uh, his operations are described as very badly performed, accomplished by much bungling, if not worse. And one example of worse was the day when he was performing a leg amputation and he gets the ends the wrong way around. So to give you an idea about leg amputations, you saw through the bone, you have to have left a flap of skin that's large enough to sew over the end of a bone. Uh, otherwise, you've just got an exposed bone, all that problem with infection that we talked about earlier. And Lucas indeed does prepare a nice flap of skin to go over the end of the bone. But he does that on the bit of leg that he's cutting off. And so that means that the leg, the bit of leg that's left is short of skin. And so he ends up having to do a further amputation up the leg so that he can get enough skin to cover the stump. And bear in mind that this, like Mary Wollstonecraft's um, procedure earlier on, are being done before there is anaesthetic. So he has to go through amputation through the bone twice. 
without anesthetic, you know, just being held down by a couple of very strong men. And this is one of Keats jobs. Keats is one of the people who has to restrain the patient during the operation and make sure they don't make too much noise to distract the surgeon, though it does seem like uh, Lucas was already a bit distracted. Other duties that Keats had were pulling teeth and letting blood. Keats would certainly have been involved in the dissection of cadavers, and it's likely that he had his own relationship with the resurrection men, the body snatching gangs. Though interestingly, the year Keats was at St. Thomas is in uh, 1816, uh, there was basically a strike. The Borough Gang, who were one of the most notorious gangs in London at that time, um, they resolved to embargo the flow of bodies to the hospital until the teachers agreed to pay an extra two guineas per corpse. And it's been suggested that staff and students had to go and dig bodies up themselves in 1816, though there is no evidence for this. Um, but if you look at Keats' poem, um, where it talks about a demon mole going through the clay soil to see skull, coffin bones and funeral stole, this does sound quite a lot like grave robbing. So he certainly either had experience or he's talked in detail to people about it. But body snatching, is part of medical life in the early 19th century. But if you've got these body bits, you're gonna to have to stop them decomposing. And today, you know, we'd use refrigeration. Uh, you've probably all heard stories about somebody who got finger, toe, penis chopped off. It gets stuck in a bag of frozen peas and they managed to successfully sew it back on. Um, back in Mary Shelley's day, frozen peas weren't generally an option. And so the way that you'd think of preserving soft tissue is kind of the way that I deal with it at Surgeon's Hall. So to preserve soft tissue, you can either dry it out and varnish it, but that leaves it something stiff and inflexible and certainly not suitable for further use. Or you can preserve it in fluid. Um, and at the beginning of the 19th century, people in London were able to see this for themselves. The Hunter brothers, William and John, were Scottish-born anatomists and surgeons who worked in London um, uh, very successfully, and they both built up very large collections of anatomy and pathology. William dies, his collection goes to uh, Glasgow University, his alma mater. When John dies, uh, his collection stays in London. He's a, he dies in 1793, he's in quite a lot of debt. Uh, he's, um, you know, he's spent a lot of money on making this collection and his family have no choice but to pay off his debts, but to sell it. And it's sold to the government who in 1899 give it to the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Um, and they moved to new premise in Lincoln's Inn Fields and this is open as a public museum in 1813. John Hunter had been allowing people to see it back in the 1780s. Uh, by 1832, more than 32,000 people are recorded having been to see John Hunter's collection. Was Mary one of them? It was certainly a very, very fashionable place. And even if she hadn't seen it for herself, well, she would have heard people talking about it because, as I say, it was a place to go. So here are some examples of John Hunter's collection. Um, one of the things about fluid preservation, at this point, it usually either turpentine, which makes the, the, um, the tissue very transparent and uh, gives it a sort of a translucent appearance, uh, or alcohol. And uh, here we've got the effects of alcohol preparation. These are both lamb's hearts. Uh, the first one is fresh, and the second one has been in alcohol for six months. So you can see it's got a kind of almost sort of bleaching effect on the tissue. Um, so again, if something like this had been done to keep the parts reasonably fresh, it would be, it would be visible in whatever was created. It's also worth mentioning that John Hunter had tried to resurrect a hanged man, this man, William Dodd, known as the Macaroni Parson. Um, he was curate to George III, but he was also you know, he liked the good life. He was living beyond his means. And so he built up incredible debts. And his clever way of uh, getting around that was to uh, write himself a bond for several thousand pounds. 
uh, and he got hanged for for fraud uh, forgery uh, because that was something that people tended to frown on frown on back then. He was good friends with John Hunter, and they, they, they'd made a pact. Uh, jo John Hunter and some uh, friends of theirs whipped his body away as soon as, it, um, as soon as he died. He was taken off to a prepared apartment on Googe Street, where uh, you know they kept it warm, they submerged him in warm water, and then they did something which involved bellows. Um, we're not entirely sure of the process, but it wasn't successful. But one thing that people are looking, were looking at at this point that was more likely to be successful was galvanism. Um, and in the introduction to the 1831 edition of galvanism, um, Mary talks about hearing Byron and Shelley um, talking about things like this, saying perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism has given a token of such things. And in Don Juan, uh, Byron says, and galvanism has set, set some corpses grinning. So what is galvanism? Well, it covers ideas that we would think of as electrophysiology today, basically the electrical properties of our tissues. And this was something that was started to be investigated at the end of the 18th century. Um, before this, you'd got William Gilbert coining the term electricus uh, after he did experiments with uh, amber and static electricity around 1600. 1705, Francis Hawksby creates an electrostatic generator. So uh, you can use that handle to rotate that glass globe. If you put your hands on it while it's spinning, that will create a blue glow on the inside from the static electricity created. And then we get the Leiden jar in 1745. That's actually invented by two different people independently. One of them's in Leiden, which is how it gets its name. Um, and this stores static electricity and allows you to discharge it basically at will. And then you get to Benjamin Franklin's famous experiments with a kite. He's out there in a thunderstorm. He's got a, a silk string that he's holding, he's hiding in a doorway. And then there's another uh, uh, a hemp thread which is connected to a key and that's wetted because that conducts electricity better. And even though the kite isn't struck by lightning, uh, even though many reports say that this is what actually happened, uh, the electricity in the air is conducted through this wet hemp to the key. And if you put your hands near the key, it'll spark. So this shows there's a connection between lightning and electricity. And we see this in an early scene in Frankenstein when uh, Victor's looking back to when he was 15 years old and he sees a tree struck by lightning. Uh, and he sees the dazzling light. When we visited the next morning, we found it, had, um, uh, it shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but utter, entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. And he says, before this, I wasn't unacquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity, but, Thinking about these puts those alchemists that he's already talked about into the shade. You know, this is something different that he feels that he can do. And then after this, we get experiments on frogs. Luigi Galvani begins to take Leiden jars and use electrodes to make uh, dead frog legs twitch. And uh, he gets into a bit of a, a, a very polite, it's very amicable spat with, um, with Volta, Alessandro Volta. And in retaliation, to try and prove Galvani wrong, he makes the voltaic pile, which is the first battery. And this leads to a sort of trend for these kind of things to the point where, um, you know, there's a, a report saying wherever there were frogs and wherever two dissimilar metals could be fastened together, people could convince themselves with their own eyes of the marvelous regeneration of severed limbs. And while I don't fully understand the ins and outs of the, uh, you know, the disagreement between Galvani and Volta, because you know, I have a sort of 18th century understanding of electricity, what's important for our story is the fact that when uh, Galvani dies in 1798, his nephew Giovanni Aldini takes up his cause. What have we got? My PowerPoint isn't working again. Hang on. <laughs> 
So where were we? We were at uh, Aldini. So Aldini takes his uncle's ideas and he tours them around Europe. Uh, he's showing them, um, you know, sort of, uh, he gets severed um, ox heads and he, he makes the eyes open and close and the tongue move. You know, he's doing this in front of vast audiences. He's part scientist, part showman. And then in London, it, it reaches, you know, its high point or low point, depending on your point of view. He gets a man called George Forster. George Forster was a murderer. He drowned his wife and daughter in a canal. And you have the 1751 Murder Act. So he gets sent off to the anatomists after he's been hanged. And they allow Aldini to carry out a very public dis um, uh, display of galvanism on the body. And this is what we get. Ooh. On the first application of the process, the jaws of the deceased criminal begin to quiver and the adjoining muscles were ho horribly contorted. One eye was actually opened. In the subsequent part, the right hand was raised and clenched and one of the legs and thighs were set in motion. And this, as you can imagine, was huge. Everyone was talking about, if you hadn't seen it, you pretended you had. But Aldini wasn't trying to actually reanimate the cadaver. He even says so in his paper that he writes about this experiment. He is actually more interested in uh, the scientific applications of galvanism. You know, the idea that you might be able to use it to treat mental illness or to actually um, resuscitate a drowned body. There was a huge movement in London towards the 18th century of trying to resuscitate people who drowned. And the ideas that you could use electricity for treatment were becoming very widespread. One person who wasn't using them quite so wholesomely was James Graham. Um, Graham was a, a medical student. He'd studied at Edinburgh University, though he didn't actually graduate. But, you know, in the 18th century, not graduating in medicine wasn't necessarily a bar to practice. He travels to the US where he learns about uh, electricity from an associate of Benjamin Franklin. And he combines this with his own field of interest, which is treating people for impotence um, or infertility. Uh, one of the, his clients was Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire. And she was having daughters, but she was not having a son. And uh, Graham's advice to her was to give herself an ice cold champagne douche every day. And if you saw the film The Duchess with Keira Knightley, you'll notice that that wasn't one of the things that was mentioned in there. But he decides that electricity can also stimulate fertility and he comes up with a number of devices that uh, may be useful in this um, thing. And he opens up in 1779, he opens up the Temple of Health just off the Strand. And this is a place where you can go and listen to him talk about um, you know, his sexual ideas while there are scantily clad women uh, moving around in uh, ornate uh, surroundings. And in 1881, he moves to a bigger premises in Pall Mall, uh, where you can use his celestial bed. The celestial bed is a massive canopied contraption, uh, 12 foot by nine foot. It's got clockwork figures all over it. There are turtle doves. There are, there's organ uh, sounds that play in response to your movements on the bed. Um, it was tilted to aid conception. And it also had uh, a generator, which sparked the bed with a celestial fire. Uh, the bed and the people on it were covered with an electrical glow. And this was meant to guarantee um, conception. And women who came along could even wear masks just so it didn't get out in society that you, know, you were having problems in that direction. To use it did cost 50 pounds a goal. Um, there aren't many contemporary images of it, however, uh, but I do love this cartoon, which shows Graham in electrical warfare with uh, one of his, uh, his rivals. And on these very, very um, 
phallic electrotherapy devices. Um, this is on the Welcome website, and I would definitely recommend going and you know, if you put celestial bed in there, this comes up. Um, and you can look at these closely. This thing says largest in the world. But a more likely use for galvanism was resusc resuscitation. And Mary had once been treated by a man called Henry Klein. Uh, we saw earlier that Henry Klein was one of Keats' teachers. Klein had also been a personal physician to Godwin. And two summers before that night in the Via Diodate, uh, he'd been involved in supplying a small amount of galvanic energy to a sailor who'd been in a coma for several months. And the sailor came to. And we don't know if the two things are actually connected, but it certainly stimulated debate as to whether or not galvanism could raise someone from the dead. And these are the things that would have been current in conversation at this point that people were talking about. And Mary would definitely have been aware of this with somebody who was so close to her personal circle. And Percy Shelley definitely had uh, an interest in electricity. He kept electrical equipment in his rooms, both at Eton and at Oxford. Apparently there was one occasion where one of his teachers got more than he bargained for when he touched the handle to Shelley's room. But experiments in galvanism start to tail off in the 1820s. And it's been suggested this may in part be down to Mary Shelley's novel. And you can imagine that it would get a bit tiresome if every time you talked about what you were doing was trying to electrify dead bodies, that people would go, what, like Frankenstein? But you can see how Victor Frankenstein has been influenced by a whole range of scientists. Uh, though they didn't actually use the word scientist until a little bit later than this. Everyone from John Hunter, Galvani, Dipple, Percy Shelley himself, they've all been suggested as being the model for Victor Frankenstein. But I think that we could see that Mary Shelley has actually taken all these ideas, all these things that were current in conversation, and she's molded them into a creature of her own in Victor Frankenstein. And that's just a fairly brief look at uh, the medical world of Victor Frankenstein. But I just want to finish with some important lessons that we can take away. And the first one, you know, if you are going to be reanimated, have good hair. And secondly, always know where you're putting your brain. <laughs>